Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, June 26, 2021. It is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. All right. What are we talking about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. I may have a lot to say about that. It's kind of a dichotomy with the market. It's really interesting. And we'll get to that in just one second. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, just some ADD and kick in, keep them on the slides. When we get to the live charts, we should have plenty of time. You can ask about anything you want. Also, hold off on your stock picks until we get to the stock charts. And then, for your benefit, ask about one stock at a time and hit return. That way, I can make sure that I covered them all, at least as many as I can at a time allowed. As I've been saying lately, I've been going through some old presentations and just. There's a lot of good stuff out there, again, if I say so myself. And I found one on patience, and then in the process, I dug up a bunch of other stuff, and there's a lot of things that are happened and happened today that created a plethora of other lessons and random thoughts on trading. So before we get into all that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often say, all predictions about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then, barring a line from Greg Morris. All right. Recently in my stock chart shows, I've been talking about the fact that attitude is way more important than aptitude. I started a series on thinking like a trader, and we are up to three so far in the series. And it probably could go on and on and on on that. So I'll have to, at some point, we have to end it. Maybe next week will be the last one. But anyway, Attitude is way more important than aptitude. And how do you think about markets and accept the way they are? And as we're going to talk about in a few minutes, your patience to let them do what needs to be done. And a lot of times that just means that you're not doing anything in the process. So attitude is way more important than aptitude. Anyway, by accident, I saw a presentation by J.C. Peretz, and he's, I don't know much about him. I guess I need to find out a little bit more, but I like his attitude towards trading, speaking of attitudes. And I saw him by accident. He's a stock charts TV contributor like me. And he said that he liked Bitcoin above 30,000 and below that, it's someone else's problem. And I thought that was a great way of putting it. Now, I don't necessarily agree with going out and buying Bitcoin above 30,000. I think there's a little bit more to just buying support. But I like the way he said it. Below that level is someone else's problem. And I think that if we think about our stops and our trailing stops as a level where it becomes someone else's problem, I think that's just a great way of kind of phrasing it all. It reminds me of Mr. Child from The Hangover. Not my problem. <laughs> my wife and I say that all the time when someone brings us a problem that's not ours. <laughs> anyway, but I thought that was kind of a cool thing to say. So I wanted to share that with you. Now, one thing that I've been doing forever, if you know me, is to figure out a way to have the short term trading pay for the longer term trading. In other words, free rolling. And the real money is in the is it is in the longer term trading. But if you can make a little money in the short term, keep the lights on, put a little money in your pocket. And if you get scratched out after, let's say, making one percent, let's say a thousand dollars on a hundred K account, one percent, right? And if you're if you do that over and over again, you're not gonna get rich, but you'll keep the lights on. And if you could do that on a swing trade basis, let's say somewhere between one day and, and let's say maybe two weeks or so and rinse and repeat, you're going to do okay. But the real money is going to be with the longer term trading. The short term trading can kind of keep you afloat in the process. Here's an example, which finally hit the profit target today. Spoiler alert. And it was Simar and it was on the service back in the middle of May. By the way, if you want to look at these, go to DaveLander.com slash archives and I updated them today so they're fairly current. Entry is 1725, protective stop 1375, 
initial profit target of 2075 for a risk of 3.5 points. And it was an IPO pullback. So this is what those parameters look like on the charts with an IPT up here. You can see it rallied toward the IPT, came back in, rallied toward the IPT again, came back in, rallied up once again. And then today, bam, it took off nicely. At one point, it was up over 25%. It did back off a little bit by the by the end of the day, and I'll show you that one in the portfolio in a second. In fact, we'll take a look at that right now. But the idea is to, again, have the short-term trading pay for the longer-term trading. Now, you don't always get this big second move out, obviously. But as you can see, it really pays when it does. Sometimes you can get 75%. Sometimes you can get 700% on a trade. Now, that doesn't happen often, but it seems to happen just often enough to make it all worthwhile. So if you were just to get the profit target and scratch out, you would make $1,000 on a trade. Now, obviously, if you lose on both your short-term portion and your long-term portion, you're out 2% or $2,000. But I hope I'm accurate enough to where I get enough swing trades to make 1,000, make 1,000, and at worst, scratch out to where I can cover those losses. So that's kind of the idea of the short-term trading and long-term trading. Now, when you see that you're up 725%, on one, you're like, well, Dave, why didn't you just keep the whole position? Well, I get that quite often, especially when you get a big winner. And the reason is you don't know the future. I mean, if I knew the future, you'd probably never see my fat ass again, you know? It's, it is what it is. And we're just trend followers. We don't know where that trend is going to take us. But man, let's just get on and, and ride that. Let's, let's go on that journey and see what happens. And every now and then, we're pleasantly surprised and we get one like this especially one that's lower price when we put it on because we ended up putting on a plethora of shares. And now, of course, the equity swings are kind of getting a little bumpy in here because if it goes up a point or two, that's that's a 0.6 to 1.2% equity swing on a 100K account, okay? But anyway, that's the ultimate goal, getting to something as soon as possible and ride it for as long as possible. And again, we call that free rolling. And that came from Charlie Kirk. That's what he called it after I showed him the money management down in St. Lucia a couple of years ago. Man, it's been two or three years. It's hard to believe. Now, patience is a big topic. I, it was kind of funny. I remember a couple of years back, I went to talk about patience because I was like, oh, I really need to talk about patience. And then I grabbed the last week's slides and Lo and behold, I talked about patience, but it's been a while since I really talked about it. And in going through these old slides, I found these and I thought it'd be worth going through it again. Now, I like to dig around a little bit until I find the definition that I like the best. And I thought this one was pretty good. The capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble or suffering without getting angry or upset. And that's pretty much trading because you have to tolerate a lot of delay, a lot of trouble, and quite a bit of suffering without getting angry or upset. Figure that out, write me a letter. <laughs> Leo Tolstoy once said, the two most powerful warriors are patience and time. One of the big things you need to do is give yourself the patience to learn. Someone contacted me today, and they're in a bit of a pickle in a certain situation and they decide that they want to learn how to trade they want to come over here and spend a few days with me and i'm like that's fine i'm all in i'm always interested in someone who's interested in what i'm doing nobody seems to really care at least people that i know you know unless the market of course drops about 50 percent, then they call me in a panic what do i do it's like well you know what do you do what do you should have done you should have watched some presentations not that i'm the grand boom bob but you should have watched some presentations or asked me before the bomb blew up. But anyway, long story endless. And it's, I said, that's ironic because tonight I'm going to give a presentation. This is five minutes after I found these slides where I talk about how long did it take you to become a doctor, a lawyer, or automatic transmission mechanic. And 
I forget the, I don't know if it's Latin or Italian. It might be Latin, but uh, Encora, Empora, something. Jeez, I wish I could remember that. But it was Michelangelo at 81 said he's still learning. So definitely give yourself the gift of time. Now, some of my older presentations, I went on a kick for a while where I talked about the fact that in other methodologies, I'm sorry, in other professions and careers, there's a clearly defined career path. And the example I think I gave last week was a plumber where you have to become a journeyman and that takes a certain level to get to a journeyman. And then you do that for a certain amount of time. Then you take the plumber's master exam after being a journeyman for years. And I know someone who decided to become a plumber and I think that was probably 10 years ago and they're still not a plumber. So it's kind of interesting that there's a, a well-defined career path, of course, for an airline, an airline pilot, an airline pilot, or someone else, but something else like a doctor, or whatever. You have you have to have so much experience and go through so much schooling and all these other things. But in trading, there is none. You just basically it, it looks easy, right? All you have to do is capture a price move. You just open up account and get started. But there is a methodology, and there is money management. And the most important thing is the mind. And as I often say, give me somebody with a good attitude, as I said earlier, as opposed to someone with, with the smarts, because the methodology can be learned. And I'm going to show you some real simple things tonight. And you guys who are, are here tonight live, I think you probably know everything I'm going to show you. But I think it helps to kind of refresh that it really can be that simple. I never said it was easy. But if you have a good attitude, you could certainly learn a simple methodology and the money management is pretty simple too. Now, as far as a career path with a methodology, find something simple and use it. I could show you a couple simple things, something like a buy at B pattern and IPOs works really well. And I do really well with that. And some of you guys do even better than me from what I can see. From what I've seen in the Facebook group, something like a Landry Light pullback, if you need something a little bit more defined for a longer term, sort of the core methodology, trend trading. And what I would encourage you to do is don't reinvent the wheel, go on the grail hunt long after you find something simple that works. I'm on some grail hunts right now, as I've talked about recently and last summer, when it comes to volatility and trying to find these what I call the holy grail days and go in and watch prior presentations if you're having trouble sleeping that night on those and so that's kind of a grail hunt for me but I've settled into something and as one of you guys pointed out when you were doing your due diligence on me several years back you found some posts from me going back to I think it was 20 something years and I was talking about the same thing that I'm actually talking about now. And I think the example was bow ties. We often talk about bow ties. We're going to talk about bow ties here in, in a few minutes when we get to the live charts. Most people go on a grail hunt and eventually they find something simple. Well, I would suggest that you flip the script on that and find something simple and then go on your grail hunt down the road. Now, once you do find something, study at least 100 examples historically. Go in and find at least 100 examples. As I've said quite a bit, I don't want to throw anybody in the bus, but I was talking with somebody once on the phone, and they were trading this pattern. I'm like, wow, when did you learn about that? And I was thinking that this is something they do all the time. And he's like, oh, I just read about it this morning. I'm like, oh, geez. Now, here's the hard part, and we're, we all – we're all we all tend to be optimists as a general statement humans are optimists optimists by nature i mean i was going to be a pessimist but i figured it wouldn't work out right with a w but you also have to play devil's advocate quite a bit and i'm really good at playing devil's advocate with other people's stuff because i could shoot some holes in it because usually you can see it from a mile away because they're too close to it to see just like last week i talked about somebody presented me with a holy grail type of system and they wanted to start a hedge fund with it and they hired me on and, and you know i started looking at it and was like first of all you know and i don't i don't know if i told them outright or not but the 
charts were looking ahead one bar and you couldn't see the one bar while they were looking ahead all his printouts were he thought that the little tick up was the time to buy but you didn't know the tick until the end of the next day and he was going to buy on that prior day's close anyway you gotta you gotta be your own devil's advocate or play devil's advocate i should say and then you want to observe in real time and I have observe in italics because you want to see how it kind of shakes out in the real markets the system designers call that walk forward testing so you want to do some of that in real time to see what happens and i've come up with a lot of stuff over the years especially way back in my programming days or when i did a lot of programming and i would come up with something i thought was great and i just immediately jump into the markets with it and get my ass handed to me because i realized or i did realize fairly quickly that i basically had a perfect system that look back in time, but when it comes to trading, you trade forward in time. Now, I would urge you to keep things simple. The example I had from a few years ago was a simple buy it B pattern. This one's a buy it B, a little bit more complex, but not, not much. The fact that the high was set on day one, you have to close above that high in addition to a new closing high. So you can see new closing high on day five. Remember an IPO with the buy at B pattern. The earliest you would get in if it comes public on a Monday, the earliest you would get in would be Friday's close if that's a new closing high and a few other caveats. And if it's also above the day one high. Anyway, so it's not above the day one high. And then you can see it traded down for a while. And right about the time you forget about it, it begins to take off. And had a nice wide range bar higher. And it closed at a new closing high, which was also above the day one high. Now, I don't know for a fact, I forgot to check before I went live. This might have been a new closing high above that high, but the range was kind of small. And what I liked about it here, I said, keep it simple. Then I'm going to show you some complexities. But that's okay. Some nuances will come out. And that's good. I like that the range expanded here, although the range was still a little small overall. If you go all the way back to the low right here, I like to see a little bit more range in an IPO. But as I said in Facebook, and I captured the post earlier, I didn't, I don't think I put it in the slides, but when we were talking about this one in Facebook, I remember saying that A was an expansion of range, even though the overall range was still a little small, but B, the banks were starting to trade like momentum stocks, and I figured that an IPO could be like a super momentum stock in that particular case. And then I also figured, what's the worst could happen? It goes back down to new lows, it stops me out, so what? Okay, it's only point and a half or so. So here's the buy my initial buy and I and knock on wood, you know, I did this across multiple accounts. So there's the buy market on close. And then this is what happened afterwards. Too bad they don't always work this well, but luckily it did trend nicely higher. And then I was able to get partial profits out of the trade. And now I am free rolling. So this is what happened afterwards. And there's the trailing stop roughly that I used. And then I got stopped out of it today. And it was 2067 where I got stopped out. The original trade was at 2094. So that's a gain of 773 times 400 shares left over. And the reason I only had 400 shares left over was I did take some profits along the way. So times 400 shares is 30.92. So I took some profits when I was up almost four points or 3.71 points, only took 100 off. But it's one of those days where I just, for some, for several reasons, people buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons, sometimes when they need money, sometimes when they have money. I just felt like it would be good to start peeling off a few shares in this particular case. And then somewhere along the line, in addition to the swing trade profit, there was a dividend or two, and I think it was about 50 bucks, and better than the poking eye. So if you add all that up, this 
trade turned into 4513. Luckily, or fortunately, I took it across multiple accounts. So this turned out to be a pretty good trade. And as Peter Brandt, Brandt once said recently, well, recently I learned that he said this, and it makes a lot of sense. He doesn't claim profits as his own until he closes out the trade. And so now these are my profits. They go into my account and I get to enjoy the fruits of my labor. But very simple pattern, very simple money management, take that swing trade off and then trail a stop on the remainder, let it gradually open up so you can capture those longer term trends. And as I've said a thousand times, if you go in from the start and you just wanna to try to capture those longer term trends, your drawdowns are going to be abysmal and your accuracy is gonna be pretty bad too. Maybe 27%, if you're lucky, will turn out into nice longer term trends. And that other 70 something percent, whatever it is, 77%, is that right? Will you'll end up losing on those trades and sometimes losing significantly. That's the problem because the reason is because if you try to if you tried to ride out a longer term correction, your stop would be that far away from the beginning. Whereas if you're just trying to ride out a swing trade, you can get away with a smaller stop and then make that gradual shift to the longer term trend. And I thought everybody knew that, like Pinocchio being a bad motivational speaker. But I was, and I've said this a thousand times too, I was on a project a while back and one of the guys on the project, he was, at the time he was running a hedge fund, but he's a brainiac. And he's like, that's pretty cool the way Dave's transitioning to the longer term trend trades by opening up his stops. And here's this guy that was a brainiac and I just thought that everybody knew that. And apparently everybody doesn't. So that was very flattering for me. Anyway, when it comes to your methodology, your career path and your patience within your career path, you can shorten your learning curve greatly by standing on the shoulders of giants. And that means discovering truth by building on previous discoveries. I've had a lot of people take my stuff, take the ball and run with it, and that's fine. I think that's wonderful. So that was a, a little Wikipedia of somebody standing on the shoulder of a giant. So there's a lot of people who've inspired me over the years. Some of these people I've worked with directly, some of these people I'm friends with, some of these people died long before me, <laughs> before I was even born, I should say. But I've been blessed with being able to learn from a lot of different people. And I've learned a lot from people that I've never met. So it's not only, you can't say, well, you had an unfair advantage. And I guess in some cases I did with certain people on this list, but I also learned from a lot of other people and I learned from some of these people before we even met them. So don't feel like, and that's, that's for some reason, people feel like they get, they have to strike out on their own. They'll let, let's say they come in and they'll be on my trading service or whatever. And after about a year or so, it's like, okay, I got it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on my own. It's like, well, you did okay, right? Yeah. It's like, well, keep me on staff. You know, I mean, I wish I had somebody doing the research. I know it sounds vain, but if I had somebody working as hard as I work, to try to find stocks and try to pick the best and leave the rest and all, I would have them on staff and keep them on staff. But for some reason, everybody feels like you have to go at it alone. And, and no, I learned from a lot of people. In fact, you know, just by accident, I, I, Mr. Peretz, I thought that was kind of interesting what he said. I like I like his attitude on that. And that's just that was just today. Obviously, you want to be aware of all the false claims out there. There was recently a lawsuit for 137 million. I always forget. Somewhere in between 100 million and 137 million. And just to show, you know, just these guys were out there fleecing people. And, you know, of course, look at me on my rented private jet and driving my rented Lambo or whatever. There's a book called The War of Art. It's not about trading. I think it's Pressville wrote it. And Steve Pressfield, I believe is his name. And the book's about, a little spoiler alert, the book's about resistance. It's it's a real easy read. 
And then I have a couple other his books here I need to get around to reading. But you better encounter a lot of resistance in trading. I probably should just do, do a, a complete show on the resistance when it comes to trading. And I think I'm, I think I may have ha may have and I, where I talked about Marcellus Wallace and you know the night of the fight, you're gonna feel a little sting. That's gonna be pride, F pride, and all this other stuff. Well, the day of the trade, you're gonna feel a little sting. That's pride, <laughs> you know, F pride. Anyway, the counterfeit innovator is wildly self-confident. The real one is scared to death. And as I've said quite a bit, Annie Duke in Thinking and Vets, a book I'd recommend you read, she talks about, and she, she calls them by name. There's certain poker players that go up to the bar and brag, and there's other poker pro players that even if they won the game, they're they like beating themselves up, like, man, I could have done so much better. I played this hand so poorly. I played this hand so poorly, and so on and so forth. And not the last week at band camp, but one of the traders in St. Lucia said the same thing. You ever notice at the bar, the newbie trader is, is talking about how great he is and what he did, and then the the more advanced trader or the well seasoned trader is like, oh man, it's like it's it's this is tough. And yeah, I did okay on this, but boy, it's been tough and I could have done so much better. So along the lines of career path and patience, study a simple money management and position management strategy that will keep losses within reasons while still allowing for unlimited gains. I got an email last weekend Somebody said, Dave, it's choppy and sideways out there. I want to implement a spread strategy that's going to be market neutral. It's like, you know, that's fine, but you could you could get chewed up pretty bad in that type of system. And if you're not really careful, you could be limited gains and impossible unlimited losses if you're trying a market neutral system. And at the least, even if you do have limited losses you still have limited gains if you're doing some kind of spreading like that so i would encourage you to avoid avoid that type of thinking and focus on how we're going to get this big outlier like the 700 and something percent outlier in cpe and some of those other stocks in the portfolio that are doing really well well, of course, you do that by chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, and you don't know what's going to turn into a big winner. I think every position I get in has a potential to turn into a huge winner. GHVI right now, I think, should go to the moon. I think we should double or triple in that. If you have kids' college funds, and just drain them all now and put all your money in that stock, right? I'm I'm kidding, obviously. Half kidding? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> So I don't know for a fact. I mean, if I knew for a fact, again, it'd be another one of those never seen my fat ass again things. But I feel like my money management sets us up, especially if you do pretty good stock picking on top of that, but it sets us up for the potential for that longer term gain within with limited risk. Now, I talk about psychology until I'm blue in the face. And once you get in the trenches, it's a lot different. Like I've been saying last two, three weeks in my stock charts presentation, you tell people markets go up and markets go down. They look, like you, they look at you like you pooed your pants. But if they get in a market and it starts going down, they don't admit it's going down. They try to tell you why it's not going down. And along those lines, we're, we have a very hard uh, uh, time admitting we're wrong. And like I said, last week at Dan Camp, in last week's week of charts, I took a personality test, scored a zero or a negative, or could have, <laughs> in agreeableness. And that's not a good trait for trading. And it, it, doing that self discovery, like the gentleman that, that wants to trade, and we talked about earlier, it's like, you know, it's, it's mostly psychological when you, when you boil it all down. And if you can learn who you are, then you're you're going that goes a long ways into making it in the market and my epiphany over probably the last 10 years or so has been i knew it was tough from a psychological standpoint but i didn't realize there was a physiological thing that is happening and i've dusted off a book on the shelf that i had on the shelves that 
has a bunch of underlining and all. I'm rereading it again. It's called The Investor's Brain. If you really want to be nerdy and get into the neurology of it all, that would be a good book to read. Uh, read The Brain by, forget the guy's name. It's a fairly small book, but it's very interesting. It has nothing to do with trading, but it's kind of a, an owner's manual for the brain. And then another book that comes to mind would be Curtis Faith, Trading from the Gut. And he talks a little bit about the neurology that's involved there and the, what's his name? Can't think of his name. But I've done presentations, Brett Steenberger, Steenberger, I've, I've done some presentations on his, the two U's where two different parts of your brain, there's one part of your brain going into the trade, and then there's another part of your brain that functions or operates once you're in the trade. And so that's part of that onion. It's like once you figure it out, like, oh man, I'm all excited about this trade. I'm feeling this way, right? Well, all of a sudden, it goes from this side of your brain to that side of your brain, or vice versa, once you get into the trade. And if you study more neurology, it's like your panic is down here in your primitive part of your brain, and then your fears a little bit further up. And then it helps to, to learn these things, again, without going too far. I would say paper trade until successful. I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader. Somebody pointed out that, well, nowadays with, with tracking as good as it is, if you're using a trading simulator, you'll probably bump into someone who's unsuccessful as a, as a paper trader. I have bumped into one guy once, said he's a little unsuccessful, so, you know, ruin your thing. I was like, well, how long have you been trading? Two weeks? I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> that doesn't count. But even with simulators, so far I haven't ran into an unsuccessful paper trade. It's a lot harder to put real money on the line. Someone in my uh, on or my was a YouTube channel after one of my presentations. It might have been in the stock charts YouTube channel after my trading simplified show. And I, I wish I could remember exactly what he said, but I think it was along the lines of trading. He he stresses out too much. And it's trading. And my answer to him was to trade at a small size that's pretty much meaningless until you are successful. And one gentleman I know of and have done some business with, he was kind of a behind the scenes type of person. And he got to interact with a lot of different traders. And and he didn't trade right away, but a couple of years later, he started trading and he was doing okay. And I'm like, you know, I've never seen anyone, even though I know you you had a, a contact with these other guys and we were able to study their methodologies and such, but I've never seen anyone just jump in and do okay. And he goes, Dave, look, I'm I'm trading at such a tiny size here. It's, it's almost laughable, but that's okay. He could build those reps at a small size and then go from there. And speaking of increasing your size, slowly increase your size until you reach the maximum of your money management strategy. Now, mine is 2%. And believe me, 2%, when I can hit it 2%, it hurts like a mother father, okay? 2% <laughs> is a lot. And I know a few people in the Facebook group that are only comfortable with like 1%. And some people are working up to that. That's fine. Just don't risk a quarter percent on this trade and 2% on this trade and 1% on that trade. Just be consistent, start small again, but very small risk, and then move, slowly move to go with bigger and bigger exposure up to 2% maximum. Now, by the way, as last week at Bandcamp and the thinking like a trader part three, I showed an example, I think it was CPE, where the initial stop was 23% away from the price, and people couldn't take it because the price, because it was so far away. It was too wide of a stop for them to use. Well, all you have to do, I know, easy said none, but all you have to do is punch it in the spreadsheet, which I'll give you if you go to davelander.com slash members and click on member resources. And I'll see if I have a direct link that's not behind the firewall and put it in the post for those who weren't a member. But download my tracking spreadsheet and put in the stop, let's say if it's three points away, four points away or whatever, and then put in your account size and how much you want to risk, and then it'll calculate the number of shares. 
and that share size will come down drastically as that risk goes up on the trade to keep you in line with your 1% risk or 2% risk, whatever you may be risking. I've done complete presentations before where I show that it's actually less riskier, believe it or not, to trade a more volatile stock but trade fewer shares than it is to trade a less volatile share, less volatile stock, because that means you're going to be putting on more shares, okay? And not enough time to get into that tonight, but just trust me, once you see the, the math on that, you'll realize that it, it's just the opposite. It's a little counterintuitive, which you might think. And then here's the other thing, the chance of that volatile stock moving so you can make money on it is a lot better than that non-volatile stock. And also something bad can and often will happen in a non-volatile stock. So you also have to give yourself time to learn and have you experienced a variety of conditions? And I say this ad nauseum, but I'm thinking about one couple in, in particular that always comes to mind. They go in and print money or they went in and print money and then all of a sudden they quit a profitable business that I'm sure took them a long time to build because this trading thing is easy. But I might be, seem like I'm picking on this, this couple, but I see it happen all the time. People come in when things are going really well and they get this permanent income hypothesis and they'll think they think that it will always be that good. Have you experienced the print money phase where you feel like God? We all have, right? And usually you come everything comes crashing down soon thereafter. Have you gone through a phase where you couldn't hit the side of the barn? I I can't imagine being a doctor, a lawyer, or an automatic transmission mechanic for 20 something years, and this go in one day and all of a sudden you feel like a dumbass, okay? <laughs> but trading is like that. You know, the, the guys in the Renner Jets and Lambos who are on their way to jail now, I would never be shot on Friday, but if they ripped off people, which they did, they deserve to go to jail. So, anyway, I digress. But there are times where you can't hit the side of the barn. It's been choppy lately. The ETF trading that I'm trying to make my profit center, or one of my profit centers, kind of hitting this lately, okay? And some days I feel like I can't hit the side of the barn. And, and that's why I'm working harder and harder on this research that we, we talk, we've been talking about again lately. But it happens. Now, knock on wood, the momentum stuff has been doing really, really well. And I joked today, well, one of my... Uh, clients that I'm very friendly with, we we trade ideas quite often. It's like my uh, my trend trading, my core trend trading is financing my day trading addiction. You know, I was kind of half kidding, but there's some truth to that. Seems like because thank God the trend trading is going well, but the market does humble you quite a bit. And then the hard phase is where you lose, you lose, you lose, you win, you win, you win, you lose, you win, you lose, you win, you lose, you win. And it seems like you never make any money. I can't think of the guy's name, Gelber maybe. And I think it was in the first market wizards. And I'll verify that in post. But he said three months out of the year, you're hot. You're so hot. You just can't believe it. You can't sleep at night. And three months out of the year, you're cold. You're so cold, you can't hit the side of the barn, paraphrasing. And then the rest of the six months, you grind it out. Win, lose, win, lose, 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 win, win, and so on and so forth. So you have to go through all of these phases. You have to go through an, an ugly bear market, okay? You have to go through a phase where you get knocked out of all your positions. So when it comes to patience, you have to be patient enough to let the market come to you. And I've been saying this ad nauseum, but the reason successful people such as doctors, lawyers, and automatic transmission mechanics, according to one of my clients who's a psychiatrist, is because they have to take whatever train wreck comes along. They can't sit around and wait for the perfect client. And that's hard to be a person of action and then come into a business where a lot of what you need to do is inaction. And then you also need a lot of patience for the market to move once you're in the trade. 
Livermore once said, it was never my thinking that made the big money. It was always, it always was the sitting. Money is made by sitting, not trading. And it depends on where you are in reminiscence of a stock operator. But some of his sitting is waiting for conditions to improve, and some of his sitting is letting a trade unfold. Don't give me timing, give me time. Once you start quoting Livermore, it's hard to stop. A man may see straight and clearly and yet become impatient or doubtful when the market takes its time about doing as he figured it must do. ARLP, I think I have that one in here. Even CPE took a while. Simar took a while. That GHVI, okay, cash in the kids' college fund, is taking its own sweet time about doing what I think it should. Luckily for me, I put that one on my trading service and I'm not going to micromanage myself out because six months from now, when it finally does stop out, I'm just kind of being a little hopeful. I could show you, hey, you know what? Here is the trade right here. Here's the actual trade I made, at least in a model account, okay, where I did follow the plan to a T. The market does not beat them. They beat themselves because though they have brains, they cannot sit tight. That's kind of alluding to the fact that smarter you are, the harder it is. Hard, hard for you to sit tight in a position. and Last week at Bandcamp, again, I think in my stock chart show, Thinking Like a Trader Part 3, I found an old slide and going through that old stuff where we had a stock that we were stuck in for a month and it was losing for a complete month. Maybe it was 22 days or 23 days, which is 20 something trading, you know, 21 trading days, I think, or 20 trading days right around a month or so. But this one was over a month where it flat out didn't work, was actually losing. And then all of a sudden it took off. And the day before it took off, when it, when it had a little bit of a fake out first, remember markets will often do the obvious in an unobvious manner. And they'll often do what they have to do to fool the most amount of people. And I borrowed that from Linda Rasky and she said she got it off the floor somewhere. She don't know where she got it. But they beat themselves because they have brains. Though they have brains, they cannot sit tight. So here's the ARLP example. And a lot of you guys here tonight are in the service. Let me know if you got bored with this thing and exited it. And I won't beat you up or anything. I won't say your name out loud. Nobody can see your name. But I'd be willing to bet that some of you probably got out. So this was a buy. And we waited and waited and waited and waited for it to trigger. And then it finally triggered, and then it starts pulling back for days and days and days. And like, now on a chart, that doesn't look like much, right? Well, that's almost three weeks of sitting in this thing, watching your profits erode. And then what happened? It took off again, and then went sideways and sideways and sideways. And it was waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And then, as you can see, it finally took off again, knock on wood. And so far, so good, it's doing okay. And hopefully a year from now, we're still in this. And even though we've been this thing, what, since the beginning of the year, so round numbers, that's what, about six months or so, six and a half months. If you look at where the price is now and where the price was, that's a pretty good return for an entire year. So annualized, even though you waited and waited and waited, it was very painful. It eventually paid off. Now, this is not to say throw caution to the wind and stick with positions forever. Stick with positions until stopped out. And sometimes that might mean sticking with a position forever or at least months and sometimes even years. Okay. If you get stopped out, you get stopped out. So be it. Just like that little bank stock. I forget how many months I was in that, but I was in that forever. It did well forever. And then finally it stopped out. So I'm in ARLP, been it, been in it forever. And I'm trying to think which one it is. It might be the CPE, but there was at least one of them in the current portfolio that we opened up at least a year ago. 
So just because I'm a trader, even though I do probably do a little too much day trading, admittedly, as my wife says, she does a lot of day trading. <laughs> I'm not like the rat hitting the cocaine button all day long. I'm willing to sit in these things and wait and wait and wait and wait. And it's pretty easy to wait and wait and wait and wait when I throw this trade out for you guys too. And I, it's almost like, okay, well, I've got to practice what I preach and I have to follow my plan. And many times, many times I come in, especially lately, and I'm getting whacked really hard. And I'm like, damn it, I should just get out of this stock. And then I look at my service spreadsheet and i see the stop is is another three points away and i'm going like oh my god i'm stuck in this stock i don't feel like letting it go three points but i just follow along and not every time not all the time obviously another one's never seen my fat ass again things but many times especially lately these things eventually take off again and i'm pleasantly surprised So again, trade at a really small size until you get your patience. Keep in mind that the market rarely moves in your time frame and to your expectations. And we put a lot of expectations on ourselves. We can give ourselves the gift of time. I'm very impatient, okay? So this is really hard for me. I don't wanna make it sound like, oh, just follow along like the grand booba. You know, it's tough for me. And I think it's tough for most people because I think we, as I've said a thousand times, we, whether we want to admit it or not, we pretty much have a shared psychology when it comes to our feelings towards the market. And we definitely have a shared neurology, okay? A loss hurts emotionally twice as much as a gain feels good, as I said before. And in reading that investor's brain book, I think it was this morning or yesterday, they said, that people with a certain gambling addiction, they feel that pain even more than the two times that, uh, what's his name, Tversky and Kahneman talk about in Thinking Fast and Slow and in other writings by them. Now, one thing you could do to give yourself some patience is to use a hard order and turn off your screen, or I would suggest if you're a little bit more advanced, put in an alert and forget about it. And I know easier said than done, but I have some stocks. I, I, I am guilty of watching my equity way too much. I have one screen, one big screen dedicated just to equity. And that's just because it's a lot easier for me just to see where everything is and then act accordingly. But I do have accounts that are just browsers. I don't even have the trading platform loaded. And in those accounts, it's a lot easier to follow along because I'm not staring at the ups and downs all day, okay? So you, you're looking at something, you're down four or five points, and you're like, oh my God, and you see how much money you're losing. And then you come back at the end of the day, and, and not all the time, but sometimes that loss is erased and you might even have a gain. Well, if you just come in at the end of the day and look at it, and make fewer observations is what I'm trying to say, then your life is a lot easier and it's a lot easier to be patient. We're also people of action. And, and, and when you're looking at that equity going down the road and doing the day, even though it's nowhere near your stop, you are encouraged to do something and it's hard not to. Keep busy and that's why I keep busy. I, I'm working on, I'm like, it seems like, especially now the stock charts presentations, for some reason, those seem to take me a long time to do. And I just work on them and work on them and work on them. And that keeps me from getting sucked into the zigs and zags and micromanaging. Now, one thing to remember is that patience and discipline does get used up. And that's something that, and I forget where I initially read that. It, it might have been in part. And uh, what's his name? Uh, Dilbert Sky, Robert, uh, not Robert, but uh, Scott, I think is his name. Uh, he talks a lot about energy management and how you're, a lot of your job is management of energy. He's not talking about trading. He's just talking about in general. And you could use up a lot of energy if you're watching that screen 
too much. I know I'm guilty. I'm guilty. Okay. He does a lot of day trading. <laughs> That's what I said when we're in. When we're talking to other people. But just remember that patience does get sort of used up. And if you don't believe me, have you ever had a child kind of aggravate you, aggravate you, aggravate you, aggravate you, and all of a sudden they do one little thing and then you snap. And then sometimes, unfortunately, it happens with a spouse. That's because your patience got used up. Now you know why that happens. And now you're just going to figure out how you're going to manage that. Commit to commitment devices. I was talking with a guy I talk with quite often. And he told me his latest commitment device. And I'm like, you've got to keep doing that so I can continue to talk about you and the chart shows. Well, as I've said before, he has his office assistant, and I'll get the name wrong, the, the title wrong, but it's it's a like the person who runs the office, okay, not not just an assistant. She would, he would hand his phone off to her and, and she would change his password after about an hour of trading and he would get busy and go back to work. Well, I don't know if they're not in the same office anymore or, or whatever, but what he does now is she has the app on his phone. On Wait, he has the app on his phone, obviously, because he's trading off his phone. And she has the app on her phone and she has access to his account. He trusts her that much. And... About an hour into the day, she sends him a text. Okay, it's it's coming. And that reminds him to stop trading because he, he likes to do a little scalping type of trading. And, and that's mostly pretty good trading for that type of trading, usually early in the morning. And so she texts him and she changes his password after she sends a text. So that shuts him down on trading for the day. Now, that's a pretty serious commitment device, but that's a that's a great thing. If you're willing to commit to some sort of commitment device, I mean, my commitment device, at least with the service stocks, is that I want to show that I rode that trend for 500% or 700% or whatever the case may be, so I know that I have to stay in the stock that long. All right. George says he's trying to save, stay with Zim. All right, we'll take a look at that. Stuart says, my wife has been cutting my hair as of late. That explains a lot. No, Stuart, I, I couldn't pick you out of a lineup. I wouldn't know. Uh, but that does open yourself up for jokes, doesn't it? All right, let's take a look at the overall market. You guys want to ask about individual stocks, do so now. When Let's take a look at the P's. Let's take a look at the other indices that I like to look at, and then we'll get to your stock picks. All right, S&P 500, close at all-time high today. Not going to argue with that, okay? I'd like to see a little bit more vigor at new highs. I'd like to see it bust up new highs and not look back, but I guess you can't have everything, right, with a W? If you did, where would you put it? Close at all-time highs, so that's, that's, that's okay, right? But I'd like to see some acceleration higher. Not Again, as a trend falling more, I'm not going to play with new high, complain about new highs. NASDAQ Composite also closed at all-time highs, up almost three quarters of percent today. Much better than a poke in the eye. As you can see, we got past these prior peaks in here. I would like this to get way past these prior peaks in here and not look back. Let's take a look at the Rusty. The Rusty's finally bringing up the rear up almost a percent and a half today. Better than poke in the eye, right? Just shy of these multiple peaks in here. I sure would like to see it break out the new highs and not look back. Now, here's the thing. In looking at a couple thousand stocks every night and maybe 100 sectors or so, 200 sectors or so, it's not as rosy as, as these indices would paint. And we take a look at, like, chemicals. You can see that they've bow tied down. We've got a chemical on the lander list tonight. Metals and mining, they're bow tied down. Okay, bow tie after all time highs, that's usually a fairly bearish signal. Consumer durables, bow tied down. Consumer non durables, the bow ties are in downtrend, proper order. Foods are in the process of bow tying down, and that could be a defensive area. Okay. Banks, I'm very bearish on the banks right now. You have a first thrust. You're going to have a bow tie here setting up really, really soon. Insurance looks really ugly. Financials in general. In fact, I told my peeps tonight, I'll tell you guys too. 
I wouldn't hold this longer term, but look how bullish this FAZ is looking. This is the inverse three times financial bear shares. I will be looking to possibly do some intraday trading on that and possibly buy it. And by the way, one thing, one way to help you see both sides of the market is to do, not that I would recommend you do a lot of it, but maybe just take a little small part of your account and trade these some of these directional shares. And if you're losing on one, it means if you'd have bought the other one, you would be winning with it. And it's very humbling trying to get on the right side of the market. But it is a good lesson. As I often say, I think it's very important that you learn how to short, not because you're going to get rich shorting, but it helps you to see both sides of the market. If you don't want to short at all, then do a little bit of trading in these direction shares, both long and short, okay? I'm sorry, it's long, but you would go long the short shares to get short. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, read the prospectuses on these, if that's the right word. Unfortunately, you can't hold these longer term. And by the way, the inverted shares eventually go to zero and they will split you to death. Some areas like retail, I'm sorry, uh, real estate doing okay in here, drugs doing okay, as you can see. Biotech has improved quite a bit as of late. Not that long ago, we had the bow tie down from all time highs. I was pretty bearish then, we got a nice thrust lower. And then we did eventually get some continuation, but now it's trying to come back. Going back to the downside, manufacturing looks questionable. Material construction is in a downtrend so far at least. These sectors are in downtrend, proper order. Leisure sideways at best. Retail looks okay. It's trying to break out and get back to new highs. Back to the downside, take a look at the transports. Bow tie down, looking questionable at best. Software, new highs, and semis finally getting to new highs. Now, I sure would like to see semis break out to new highs and not look back. Mike says, couldn't you make the argument that the way markets keep making new highs is through rotation to some sectors with will lag and others strong and so on? Yeah, that's a good point. And it's like biotech a while back. It's like, oh boy, here we go in biotech and drugs too for that matter. But here, here we go in biotech, but then biotech started coming back. Same thing happened with the semis. So yeah, Mike, you're right. And that's good because if the market does keep going higher, then maybe these sectors will catch up, and then maybe these sectors will push the market higher. It's kind of like, I think what you're alluding to is kind of like metals and mining, right? Metals and mining were going higher, and gold really wasn't doing that well for a while, at least, okay? Gold was headed lower, silver was headed lower, but metals and mining, same period, was actually headed higher. And my point then was, if gold begins to rally and silver begins to rally, it's going to help metals overall, and they did. However, on the flip side, if they kept dropping, then eventually it would put a little pressure on the market. My big concern here is that it's financials such as banks, insurance, and then it's also conglomerates, not conglomerates, I'm sorry, durables, non-durables, and all these other sectors I went through, plus a few more. That just seems like a lot of negative action happening right now. But as long as the P's are at new highs, as long as the Russell's at new highs, which is not quite there yet, obviously, and then and Nasdaq's at new highs, I'm not going to get too, too excited. I'm going to put on a short or two. I'm short a home builder right now. I'm looking to short a bank or two. And I'm not going to go short crazy, believe me. I'd much rather just stay long. But sometimes you have to play the hand that's dealt. So, yeah, Mike, that's a good point. There's a few there's a few ifs in that sentence though, right? It means if they turn back up for sure. All right, let's take a look at some of your stock picks. OMP. Yeah, I like this one. This has been coming up in my scans. And two things. It's a little bit on the thin side, which is okay for position trading. And the only thing I don't like about it is the way that it kind of shot up and came right back in. And it only had a couple of big up bar days, and then now it's back in. But as a general statement, I think it looks okay because it, it did break out from this level, but then it came all the way back in. That's the only thing I can kind of pick apart on it. But for the most part, I think it's a good looking stock and I think you're onto a decent stock there. It's okay, all right? But I think you can maybe find, well, at this juncture, there's not a, believe it or not, at this juncture, there's not a lot of longs out there. 
And that's probably because the indices are at new highs. ME, 23 and me. <laughs> a lot of criminals are getting caught with the 23 and me. Somebody's got some kind of weird DNA and then somebody commits a crime with a weird DNA and, it, and they link the pieces. Really interesting stuff. Um, you got an okay range on here. It went from 11 to 13. I don't think I'd buy it as a pullback just because you just have one big bar. But yeah, buy it B if it closes above this level here, whatever that is. Let's uh, I'll give you an exact number on that. I think if it, I think it's got enough range to where if it closes above 13.55, so let's just say 13.60 or higher, maybe 13.70 or higher, it would be a buy. But until unless it does that. I would stay away from it or just what's tonight's topic? Patience. Ooh, daddy like. This is pretty interesting here. Okay, now I'd play a deep retracement on this one. IPSC. 200,000. I'd like to see a little bit more volume to make sure it's liquid enough. You'd have to check the spread, make sure you have a decent spread. You know, with IPOs, with risk comes reward sometimes. Sometimes you get them and they get really thin. And then as uh, John Ross, I think, said here, I always get, I always forget who said it, but Hotel California, you know, when it comes to get out of these things. They'll let you in, but they won't let you out. So I would look for a deep retracement on this or actually, believe it or not, a new closing high as a possible entry on that. So good eye on that one, David. D-N-A-Y. Um, this one doesn't excite me as much. It looks like it's a little bit on the thin side. So check your, check your spreads on it. Okay. And also wait for a new, a close above this bar here before looking to get in. I wouldn't play a retracement because it really hasn't taken off to retrace. Can you talk about spread on IPOs? What's the spread? Okay, spread is the difference between the bid and the ask. Okay, so if a stock's really liquid, let's just take this one for instance. It might be if it's really this was really really a liquid stock, it might be 940, 941, 942, or something like that. Okay, 1940, 1941, 1942 bid and then an ask respectively. So obviously you're going to pay the ask if you want to get into the trade. So this thing's bidding 19 and asking 21. As soon as you get into it at 21, you have a two-point loss, okay? You will have to pay up sometimes. And sometimes I might close my eyes and do it, and gosh darn if it's not the most painful thing you do. But sometimes I'll close my eyes and pay up and pay a half a point spread on some of these. But if it gets much wider, I begin to get really, really, really skeptical. And sometimes you have to wait until the spread gets better. Now, if you're doing like this Russian doll stuff, and I'll go ahead and pull it up anyway, uh, even though it's on a laundry list. Like I've been trying to, wanting to get in this one, okay? Even though the volume's pretty good, this is an established issue. Now, if you wanted to take a position trade in this thing, no problem, okay? Because over time, that's, that's gonna work its way out with the spread, and that's okay, it's no big deal. But if you're trying to trade something intraday like this, then you're going to get chewed up because you're going to, you're going to instantly have like a 40 cents or a 30 cents loss. Let's say you're just buying a thousand shares, right? Well, that's that's $300, $400 instant loss like that. And if you're making an intraday trade, you're going to have to make up that three or $400 by the end of the day, right? So you're going to have to really watch the spreads on these things. So if you have just, would you, would you go to buy something with a brokerage? They'll, they'll give you the spread in the ass. I'm sorry, the, the, bid and the ask and the difference between the bid and the ask is the spread okay all right any more stocks you guys want me to look at let me just pull up ghvr or waiting yeah i just think this thing should just absolutely rip and i don't know why it hasn't ripped yet this is an ipo it took off got a little bit ahead of itself went down bottomed out okay nice little bow tie here Kind of took off. I was feeling pretty good about it. Then it came right back in. But I'm going to continue to just honor my stop and wait. Okay. Any more stock, individual stock picks? Going once, going twice. 
Well, as usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time on your busy schedule. Oh, before I forget, not doing a show next Thursday night, okay? And I'll talk about, maybe talk about why not in the Facebook group. It's a little bit more private than telling the whole world. <laughs> All right, we've got one last one, and then we'll uh, we'll shut her down. Sean wants to know about LEDs. Yeah, this is one that's been on Landry List quite a while. This is one you could possibly day trade because look at the size on that and do a Russian doll. I think this thing still looks pretty good. HV is through the roof, okay? So consider yourself warned on that one. I I don't think I could position trade this one just because it's so crazy, all right, with an HV of 261. However, I have looked at it a couple times intraday with the thoughts of trying to capture an intraday move. So possibly that would be one way to do it. Paul says, good stuff. Well, thank you, Paul. Paul's a new client. I appreciate you. Just hang in there, buddy. We'll uh, we'll get some we'll get some good stocks in here. I appreciate I appreciate you very much. All right, thanks everyone. If we don't talk between now and then, everybody have a good weekend. And then remember, no show next week. Thank you guys and girls so much. Appreciate it.